Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, it's in His name that we welcome you to worship this morning at First Presbyterian Church as we come together as God's people in God's house on God's day. Uh, we know that He especially meets with us here as we worship. That as the Scriptures command us to worship in spirit and in truth, in reverence and all, it tells us that because God here is in our midst. We are supernaturally, yes, unexplainably, but supernaturally called up into the heavens so that we can join the angelic courses above, hearing our God speak through the reading and preaching of His Word, and also joining the courses above in praise and adoration to our God for who He is and what He has done for His people. And so we hope that you've come anticipating uh, we hope that you've come expecting because our God has said in His presence there is life everlasting and no one leaves from the presence of the Lord the same in which they came. And so we know that God's Word will have success this morning. We know that as the Word is read and preached that we will be uh, sanctified, conformed into the image of His Son. We know that sinners will be saved, believers encouraged. And so we are thankful for the work that God will do this next hour amongst us here. Before we enter into worship, if you look on the back of your bulletin, uh, page 8, there are a few announcements that we need to mention. Uh, the first one is that we have multiple committees meeting this afternoon. The Christian Education Committee will meet with Ruling Elder Kay McGirt at 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. This will be to plan the annual fall festival. And also the missions committee will be meeting with ruling elder David McLaurin at 5 p.m. in the ladies' parlor. This is to begin conversations about uh, our benevolence budget for the 2023 year and also to discuss uh, our annual missions project, Table of Plenty, uh, that takes place the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And so we hope that if you are interested in that work, if you are on those committees, that you'll make uh, or you'll take special attention to be there. Uh, speaking of missions, we are offering a missions opportunity to Tegucigalpa, Honduras next summer, June 24th through July 1st. This mission trip is open to anyone ninth grade and older. Uh, and so if you're interested in possibly going on this trip, we'll have an interest meeting next Sunday at 4.30 in the afternoon in the fellowship hall. So if you're interested in going with us to Honduras for a week next summer, first interest meeting next Sunday, October 9th at 4.30 p.m. And of course next weekend is a big weekend here within the life of our church because we're going to have our annual fall Bible conference as well with Dr. Manel Nance. Uh, we've been announcing this for a number of weeks, but we are... Uh, very excited about uh, Dr. Nance being with us. Uh, Dr. Nance is the pastor of Ballantyne Presbyterian Church in the Charlotte area, also a visiting professor, lecturer at RTS in Charlotte. Uh, and he has uh, been writing in uh, the, the Christianity world about the Trinity. And so he just a couple of years ago had a book on the Trinity uh, published, um, and so he will be actually discussing, preaching on, teaching on uh, his topic, our triune God of grace and how the Trinity influences our worship, our work, our witness, and our Christian walk. And so we hope that you'll be with us. 6 p.m., a fellowship meal uh, for the whole church will be served in the fellowship hall. Immediately following that fellowship meal, we'll have an abbreviated worship service here in the sanctuary. And then Sunday... During Sunday school, morning worship, evening worship, Dr. Mantle will be uh, with us. And so we hope that you'll be uh, in attendance. And we're praying that you will be in attendance because we know that this will be a, a great time of fellowship and time in the Word together. That concludes our announcements for now. Let us uh, prepare our hearts for the worship of the living God.
as we come into the courts of heaven to worship and to praise. Our God calls us to worship by His Word. If you look at page 2 in our bulletin, you see that our responsive call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 27, verses 1 and 4. If you'll please stand as you're able and let us enter into worship as our God calls us to worship, saying, One thing I have asked that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of my days to gaze upon His beauty. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Let us worship Him. As we come to worship our God, Creator and Redeemer, we come singing praises unto His name. And so let us take our hymn books out and turn to page 16. This is a psalm that we're going to sing together, Psalm 98. And we're going to sing verses 1 through 5. Let's sing aloud. Let's pray. Our God, our King, our Creator and Redeemer, Lord, we come to you this morning to worship you alone. Uh, You alone are God, and you are uh, worthy of our worship, Lord. Uh, We come to you as the one who rules over the storm, even that which we have experienced this past several days. We come to you in whom there is no darkness at all, Uh, Lord, we come as creatures, but we also come as those uh, who have turned from you, but who can come to you through the one mediator, Lord, that you have given uh, for our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come by the power of your Spirit to worship you. Lord, would you enable us to worship? We confess we are utterly unable to do so apart from you. Uh, Would you enable our worship, Lord? We need you, uh, we ask this morning. And Lord, we do come together now, uh, praying the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, praying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as we uh, come together this beautiful morning that God has given us, let us remember to be faithful in our giving of our tithes and offerings. Uh, Deacons, if you'd come forward during this time.
Let's pray again. Our Lord, we uh, come to you, and again, on this beautiful morning after a, a storm comes through, Lord, we're grateful for uh, your grace is to us, Lord. We know every good and perfect gift comes from above, uh, Lord, comes from you. Uh, and Lord, we do thank you for the, the multitude of ways in which you bless us. And Lord, we do thank you that you bless us with uh, financial um, gifts and, and uh, the ability to support the church and the work of the church. So we pray that you would uh, bless this money, that it would go towards the work of your kingdom, Lord, that you would help us all to continue to support and uh, step out in faith, Lord, and trust you. Again, thank you for giving us the ability to do so. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you would uh, take your hymnal again and turn to hymn number 252, uh, as we get ready uh, to hear God's word, let us uh, remind ourselves why we're able to read God's word as sinners and not have terror is because of the cross, because Jesus went to the cross and suffered for us. So let us sing together. Please remain standing as you're able. Let's sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Seated. As you're seated, as we come to this time of uh, reading God's Word, I'd invite you to turn your Bibles to uh, Isaiah chapter 63. If you don't have a Bible uh, or you want to use the Pew Bible, this section of God's Word will begin on page 790, um, the choir, and will be released. And uh, uh, if you have a child that you'd like to go to Children's Church, they will also meet in the back of the sanctuary.
As we come to our reading this morning in Isaiah 63, uh, we continue in Isaiah, as is common, to go back and forth with this pronouncements of, of judgment and then pronouncements of blessing and, and redemption. And we're going to see both again uh, this morning in our reading in chapter 63. We'll see uh, the Lord and his, his complaint that he alone uh, was found to go and carry out his will. But then we're going to see a good response from the, the prophet Isaiah, one I think that should teach us a lot, is we're going to see Isaiah praying, um, Isaiah praying to the Lord here and asking him, praying that God uh, would remember his promises. We are guaranteed that God cannot lie. The Bible says God cannot lie. And uh, he goes and he prays that God will remember his people and have mercy. So again, uh, we'll see this here in Isaiah 63. So give your attention now to God's word. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Basra, he who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them, according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put them, who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths? Like a horse in the desert, they did not stumble. Like livestock that go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make for yourself a glorious name. Look down from heaven and see, from your holy and beautiful habitation. Where are your zeal and your might? The stirring of your inner parts and your compassion are held back from me. For you are our Father, though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O oh Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from of old is your name. O oh Lord, why do you make us wander from your ways and harden our heart? so that we fear you not. Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Your holy people held possession for a little while. Our adversaries have trampled down your sanctuary. We have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who are not called by your name. As far as the reading of God's holy word, would he write its truths upon our hearts. If you'll keep your copies of God's Word open, and let's flip over to the New Testament, Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, this morning our sermon text is going to come from verses 1 through 11. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. As we return to God's Word, let us pray for His help. 
Father in heaven, we would pray that you would look down upon us from your glorious throne in the eternal places and that you would see us, your servants, your sons and daughters who need to hear your word, who need to hear you speak, who need to be guided all of our days by your word and by your spirit. And so, Father, as we heard the words of the prophet Isaiah, as we hear the words of the Gospel of Mark, would you indeed write these truths upon our hearts? Would we come to this word knowing that it is fully inspired, that these are God-breathed words, that they're full of authority and application? And would you allow these words to pierce our hearts so that it might encourage where it needs to encourage Convict where it needs to convict. Sanctify us, we pray, by the truth. Your word is absolutely true. And so, Father, let us pay careful attention. Let us be diligent in our labors to be active hearers of your word this morning as we turn our attention to the sermon. We know that this is a work of the Spirit, so pour out your Spirit upon us afresh. We're asking for more of your Spirit, and you tell us that the Father in heaven will give us more if we simply ask. And so we ask in faith, knowing that you will give us uh, an overflowing of what we need. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Again, we're looking at Mark chapter 14, verses 1 through 11, and we've been journeying through the gospel of Mark for uh, many months now, and we are here in the middle of what we would call the Passion Week. Most scholars agree that we're somewhere around the Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday night, seen within the Holy Week. Christ has turned His attention to uh, the cross of Calvary. He has turned His attention to His sacrificial death, His burial, His resurrection. And He is preparing His disciples all the more for what is soon to take place. We find our Jesus now teaching us about devotion. And even before we read our text, we must ask the question, if there's one kind of question of application that we might ask ourselves this morning, it would be, what are you devoted to in this life? You know, that's a question that we're often faced with. What are we truly devoted to? Are there things that we're devoted to Or we want so badly that we will make tremendous sacrifices in other areas of our life in order to get them. Is there something that you might would say that we would take great risk in order to achieve? That would be what we're devoted to. And in this passage we have before us in the first 11 verses of chapter 14 of the Gospel of Mark, we have really a case study. A a character study, a comparison, if you will, between two individuals. We have a woman who is going to show her absolute beautiful devotion to Jesus. And then on the other hand, we'll have a disciple's hideous devotion, not to his Lord, but to himself. We'll have a woman who takes her most prized possession and gives it, gifts it to Jesus. And then we will have... One disciple grasping the money bag so tightly, showing that he is only devoted to himself. And so I want you to even think about, evaluate your lives, ask those hard questions. What are we devoted to even as we read these first 11 verses? Hear now the word of our God. It was now two days before the Passover, Wednesday, and the feast of the unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, Why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, 
And whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to portray him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever. And so you can imagine the scene that's being set before us here in Mark chapter 14. We entered into the Passion Week, Christ's last week of His earthly ministry before His death burial and ultimately his resurrection in chapter 11 when he enters into the city during the triumphant entry and then for the next couple of days he judges the temple rebukes the religious establishment they attempt to put him to a test but he always flips their test back on him and they leave frustrated and now they're pondering in the midst of the night uh, how to get rid of Jesus In fact, the first two verses of our text really sets the stage for what will take place in chapters 14 and 15. Here they are in secret, by stealth, Mark says, trying to find out a way to arrest Jesus and to kill Jesus. But they have this problem. It's the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It's the coming Passover. The city of Jerusalem has doubled, if not tripled in population because there's many people who have now come to the temple to perform these annual sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin. And they have a fear of man. You remember this trend in which the religious establishment is wrestling with. They fear man. They fear man in the eyes of the Roman government because they, they see Jesus and He's teaching against the religious establishment. He's causing what they would say a riot. He's causing what they would say an anarchy. And yet, the Roman government, especially now this week, are breathing down their necks and saying no one is to be out of line during this feast, during this Passover week. We're watching you Jews to ensure that you do not step out of line and you do not do anything that's out of accord with our Roman government. And so they fear the Roman satyrians. They fear the Roman officials. But also at the same time, they fear their fellow Jews. Because many upon many upon many have followed Jesus. Has said out loud that this man is a great teacher. That he is the Christ, the Messiah that was promised of old. They have worshipped Him. They have glorified Him. They have seen the many miracles that He has done. And they are infatuated with this man called the Christ. They do not want the religious leaders to put Him to death. At least not yet, it seems. And so, to, to, to ensure that there's not an uproar from the people, if there's not an uproar against the Roman government, they are they are. Stealthily, stealthily, I don't even know how to say that. They are in the quiet of the night trying to figure out a way to put Jesus to death. And in the midst of all this, Mark tells us a story of a woman there in Bethany who decides that she is going to take this alabaster flask of of ointment, of pure nard, and she is going to pour it over the head of of Christ. Now there's something interesting about our text. If you were paying attention here, we have the plot to kill Jesus with the religious establishment working in the middle of the night trying to figure this thing out. And then we have in verses 10 and 11, Judas appearing before this same religious establishment seeking to betray Christ. And now they have their opportunity. But in the middle, we have this beautiful story of this woman anointing Jesus at Bethany. I'm going to teach you a very scholarly term this morning. This is called, and we've seen this before, a Mark sandwich. That's literally what the scholars call it. We've paid good money to read books in in seminary who tell us that this is a sandwich story. 
there's a story within the midst of another story. So we have the religious establishment, but in the middle we have the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. And Mark writes in this way so that we'll pay attention to what's in the middle. We all know the best part of the sandwich is the middle, right? And now all of a sudden, the best part of this story is the devotion of this woman at Bethany to Jesus. And what even her her actions of devotion are preparing Jesus for, as He says, this is an anointing beforehand for my burial and ultimately my resurrection. And so that's what I want us to see first is this woman's beautiful devotion to Jesus. Here, Jesus, as He frequents Jerusalem during this last week of His earthly life before He is put to death and and has a victorious resurrection from the grave under the sovereign hand of the Father, Jesus has been traveling from Bethany to Jerusalem. Now, Bethany is about two miles east of the Mount of Olives, and so they've been traveling back and forth, not a terribly long distance, but enough distance for their feet to hurt, for them to be pretty sweaty, uh, for, for them to be hungry when they return. And so we have this this scene, if you will, of Jesus and His disciples returning from Jerusalem to Bethany. They are reclining at the dinner table, and it is fitting. It's actually a cultural norm for there to be some sort of ointment that would be dropped over the head of the travelers so that they might smell a little better. You can imagine the hygiene isn't as... Uh, great as it is today. They didn't run to you know, their restrooms and take a shower. They're sweaty travelers. They're dirty. They're reclining at the table. Yes, they've had the purification rites of washing hands before they eat, but to, to kind of alleviate some of the stench, the host would drop a little ointment on the head of her visitors. And yet the scene is that this woman takes an alabaster flask of ointment, of pure nard, very costly, and she breaks the flask and pours it all out over the head of Jesus. Now you have to understand that this is taking place at a dinner, and it tells us exactly where this dinner is. It's at the house of Simon the leper. And you ask, well, who is Simon the leper? Well, we don't know exactly who Simon the leper is, but we know that if he's hosting a a dinner party, if you will, He's no longer a leper. It's Mark trying to give you just this hint of there's this man who is hosting this dinner party for Jesus and His disciples and he has been healed by Christ Himself. Well, who else is at this dinner party? Well, there's this woman. Who's this woman? This woman is Mary. We know from the account of this uh, story in Matthew chapter 26 and John chapter 12, we have Mary the sister of Martha. We have Martha here at this dinner party. And we also have Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. And if you know what happens in John chapter 11, it's not just the leper that is here that Jesus is healed, but Lazarus is sitting at the table. And Lazarus was just dead in John chapter 11. And so you can imagine the conversation that's taking place at this dinner party. You have Lazarus And you have Simon, and they're talking about the miracles of the Lord. And you have the disciples, and they're they're probably still dumbfounded by the fact that Lazarus is sitting here at this table, and they're recognizing the power of this Christ. And then you have Martha, and Martha's probably serving the tables. And Mary, she comes in with this alabaster flask of ointment, of pure nard, very costly, and she begins to pour it over the head of Jesus. And if you notice, just in the way that Mark writes verse 3, remember Mark is writing almost in a hurried sense. Mark doesn't give us a lot of details. He didn't even tell us who was at this dinner party. You would think that Lazarus being here would be an important, an important detail to add. But Mark is writing in such a hurried pace, it seems, that he even misses that detail or skips that detail, but he intentionally tells you that this ointment is very costly. It's pure nard. 
and she breaks the flask of alabaster. Even the flask itself is worth much. And she pours it all over Jesus. Now why would Mark skip something like the detail of Lazarus being present at the dinner and and add the details of what sort of ointment this is and what kind of flask this was. And he's showing you the, the absolute devotion of this woman. He even underlines it by saying that one of uh, the disciples or some of the disciples were, were angry at Mary's devotion or outpouring of her devotion to Christ that they begin screaming, we could have sold that for more than 300 denarii. And if you're looking at your Bibles and you have a little uh, subscript there beside denarii, you could follow it down. Mine's number five and it says a denarius was a day's wage of labor. And so you can... You can you can automatically, even I can do the math here, that's almost a year's worth of salary that this woman has now broken and poured over the head of Jesus. Marx goes out of his way to tell you this is a $30,000, $40,000, $50,000 gift that she has now gifted Christ. And some of the disciples are put off by her devotion to Him, but Jesus says that her devotion is absolutely beautiful before his eyes. The scene is actually very dramatic as she shows her devotion for Jesus. Remember, I said the customary norm would be for her to take just a drop and put it on each traveler's head. The other travelers matter not to her. They they matter not a thing to her. Her focus is on Jesus, that He must have the best of the best that I have to offer. Yes, there's food being served. Yes, there's other people in the room. But I will take this gift, this this prized gift, and I will pour it upon the head of my Lord. You see, she understands the invaluable the invaluable grace that it is to be in the presence of Christ. That's her devotion. Her devotion is to say that nothing else matters because now I have Jesus before my eyes and He is more valuable than anything that this world has to offer. You know, it took some heart searching, I'm sure, for Mary to display such a vivid sign of devotion. That as she wrestled with this thing, she would say, yes, this is my my most prized possession. And yet it pales in comparison to my Lord. She understands Jesus' infinite worth. She understands that her most precious possession on this side of heaven is nothing compared to the honor that she must give her Savior. And you know, we must wrestle with these things as well. We must wrestle with what total devotion for Christ looks like in our life. What's it going to look like for you and me to display our utter devotion to Jesus? And I understand that there is not a cookie cutter answer here. It will be different for each of us. We all have different gifts and talents. We all have different kinds of possessions. We have different vocations. We have different spheres of influence. We have different opportunities. But as we wrestle with this, what can we do to show our devotion to Jesus where He would say, she has done what she could. And that's not a demeaning phrase by Jesus at all. It's that she has given up everything to devote her life to me. What can we do to show our complete devotion to Him? And you understand, don't you, it's just not the sacrifice of the gift that she gives, but it's the posture of her heart as she gives it. It's the beauty of her willingness, her delight to pour this oil, this ointment upon the head of Jesus, it's a great joy for her to express her love and devotion to her Savior like this. You might say she's never been so excited about any idea in all of her life as she wrestled with it. 
And as she said, this is what I'm going to do, it's as if she ran to Christ. She broke through the crowds and she began to, to break this flask, to pour out the ointment upon His head. You could, you could make the argument, couldn't you? That this flask, of course, has a little lid and, and she could have just simply took the, the lid off and began to pour it over the head of Jesus. She's so excited about this that she doesn't even have time to unscrew the top. She just says, I'm going to crush it. And I'm going to pour it over the head of my Lord because I cannot hold it back. That I'm going to give everything that I have, the most precious thing to me, and I'm going to bring it to Jesus. I'm going to say, this, my Lord, is for you. And of course, even as we think about utter devotion, complete devotion to our Christ, We must say that all of our lives belong to Jesus. Yes, He tells us in His Word to give our talents unto Him. To live for His glory. No matter if we're eating or drinking, do it to His praise. Yes, He calls us to give back the first fruits of those blessings that He gives us in heaven. But we could really say that full devotion means that we give our lives to Him. And so we must run to our Christ as Mary did. We must break through the crowd as Mary did and lay down our lives before Him and say, this, my Lord, is for you. Nothing in this life would bring me more pleasure than giving you my all. Isn't it exactly what we sang in When I Survey the Wondrous Cross? Demands my life, my soul, my all. That's what devotion to Jesus looks like. And that's what I hope it will look like in your life as you ponder these things throughout the rest of this afternoon and even this week of how we can show to our Lord that we are fully devoted to Him But remember we said that that there's a comparison going on, a a character study, if you will. That we have this wonderful, beautiful devotion of Mary, but then we have this hideous devotion of Judas to himself. So in contrast to this, this glorifying devotion, we have Judas on the opposite end who is devoted to not Christ, but his own wealth his own prestige, his own power, his own hate for the ways of the Lord, his own selfish gain, we might say, his own radical pursuit to betray his master. We see that coming out here in verse 4. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than... 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they scolded her. Now remember, we have parallel accounts in other Gospels. In Matthew chapter 26 and John chapter 12 actually tells us that it's Judas Iscariot, the, the disciple who is about to portray Jesus, who begins this ridiculing of Mary. It actually said that He did not care for the poor, even though the poor was brought up here. Couldn't we sell this for 300 denarii and give it all to the poor? But he's sitting there in John chapter 12, gripping the money bag and wanting to keep for himself the money that would be made from selling this ointment. And so you see the wickedness of his heart, and in his wickedness, he begins to stir up the disciples against Mary. And I actually think that that's something that we can learn from. It's it's easy to get in some sort of a a critical vacuum, isn't it? Especially Especially when things aren't going our way. We hear one person being critical and it's really easy to to jump on that bandwagon with the critical person and begin to be critical and criticize alongside of them. And that's the vacuum that the disciples find themselves in. They hear Judas Iscariot going, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Mary. You've wasted this prized possession? on Jesus, and now these disciples begin to, begin to question the same thing. They begin to allow this criticism to, to leak into their own hearts, and they find themselves complaining alongside of Judas. One commentator, one commentator said, a little complaining encourages a lot of complaining. 
And that's what we have going on. We have a critical spirit within the room and now more criticism is being established. And Jesus immediately begins to fight against this critical spirit. Verse 6. He says, leave her alone. Now this is the, the, this is the Lord, remember? This is the Lord who has spoken that the seas be calm and the seas were calm. This same Lord who created each and every one of these men complaining speaks to them and says, you leave Mary alone. What has, what has she done for you to trouble her? She has done not a wasteful thing, but a beautiful thing to me. Read the next verse, verse 7. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. What is Jesus implying here? The end is near. He's saying, listen, it is good for you to devote yourself to the care of the poor. It's good for you to, to, to care for the least of these, and yet that mission will still be here. But I am soon to leave. So she is showing her devotion to me, and actually what he says is preparing me for my death and my burial. The stark contrast here between Mary and Judas overflows when Judas leaves the dinner party and he goes to the religious leaders, the chief priests, and he strikes a deal in order to betray Christ, His Master, His Lord, the man that He has followed for three years. He says, I'll do it, and I'll do it for money. And they are glad, and they promise to give Him that money as He betrays Him. And immediately it says, and He sought an opportunity to betray Him from that moment forward. But you know, in this comparison... In this contrast, maybe would be a better word, between Judas and Mary, we have Jesus standing there with a beautiful devotion to His people as well. Even in the midst of what is soon to come, with His death, with His false accusations, with His murder, He has on His mind the love that He has for His people. And it shows itself, right? It, it shows itself in verse 8 of chapter 14. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Again, it's not a demeaning phrase here that he's saying she's done all she could. It wasn't good enough, but she's done what she could. No, he is saying I have found complete joy in this action that she has performed for my sake. It's like the, the poor widow woman at the end of chapter 12 that we handled a number of weeks ago where Jesus see her, sees her drop her two pennies into the offering plate. And where all the other members of the congregation are, are looking at her in utter disgust because she's only given two pennies. Jesus has said out of her poverty she has put everything that she had, all she had to live on in the plate and it is beautiful in my sight. Jesus knows that it's for that widow. Jesus knows that it's for Mary that He will be betrayed. That He will be tried in the midst of the night. That He will be murdered at the hands of the religious establishment. That He will be nailed to the cross and that He would die and be buried for their sake. Those who are fully and completely devoted to Him. And so with unwavering eyes, He begins to tell them again, I'm not going to be with you much longer. He's told them that in chapter 8. He's told them that in chapter 9. He's told them that in chapter 10. Even now, as the imminent death and burial of the Lord is coming, He says, it is for these that, that are fully devoted to Me that I will suffer and I will die. I will take delight in putting my life down for them, for their love for me is, is clear. Not just clear to me, but clear to the world. And so much so that when the gospel is preached, 
this story of Mary will be remembered from generations to generations. The whole world will know what she has done for me. And it's not that she spent $30,000 on an ointment and poured it over the head of Christ. No, it's that she was fully devoted to her Lord and Savior, Jesus. And it comes as a searching question for us. It comes as an encouragement to us. Maybe it comes as a conviction to you that we must take our eyes off of the comfort of this world and we must focus our devotion upon Jesus. And as we see Him in all of His holiness and yet in His sacrificial death, we will see that the cross of Calvary was for us. And we will see that He is worthy of our praise and our honor and our total devotion from this time forward and forevermore. That it was for us that He laid down His life as we look to Him in total love, adoration, praise, honor, devotion to Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do come as a thankful people, thankful for the gospel of grace. That the gospel of grace says by your word and by your spirit you come and breathe new life into our lungs. You replace our heart of stones with a heart of flesh so that we might seek after thee. And Father, as we seek after thee, let us cast away all of those things that might take our eyes off of you. All those worldly cares and comforts, but let our devotion be totally to you. And no matter, O oh Lord, what you call us to give up on this side of heaven, let us know that it has no worth in comparison to Your glory and Your grace and Your mercy and Your long-sufferingness with Your people. And so, Father, as You care for us, let us, let us find ourselves close to You. Let us find our eyes attached, always looking, focused on the cross of Calvary where You show Your total devotion for Your people. And we are encouraged to give our life, our soul, our all to Thee. Father, we pray that we would ponder these things this afternoon for the rest of the week so that we might better serve You, better love You, and better witness for You. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's good for us to sing in response to God's Word. And so if you'll take those hymn books out again... And let's turn to hymn number 571. Let us sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus.
Let me remind you of our evening worship service tonight at 6 as we continue our journey through Paul's letter to the Galatian church. Also, let me remind you, if we do not see you again, that Fall Bible Conference starts next Saturday night at 6 p.m. with a fellowship meal. We hope that you'll be with us. Now receive uh, the Lord's blessing. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.